Welcome to twoquestions.tv. Joining me today is Gary Morton, and we're talking about clarity of purpose and extraordinary leadership. Welcome to twoquestions.tv. I'm your host, Susan barantini -Mo. My guest today is Gary Morton, a West Point distinguished graduate who served as a tank officer in the only unit ever to win every battle at the Army's grueling National Training Center. At, med at the medical device maker Stryker, he co-founded and led its highly innovative EMS equipment business. His acclaimed new book, this book, Commanding Excellence, is available now, and we're talking about the de that today. Gary, welcome. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, first, thank you for your service. Absolutely. And um, I enjoyed your book very much. It's an amazing book. <laughs> it's really good. I mean, the, the concepts about leadership, I was like, yeah, yes, yes. We're turning the pages going, absolutely. So, um, well, that, that's a that's an important endorsement. I yeah. appreciate that. I, <laughs> yes, you can get this, you know. Yours is this book. You should you should read this book. <laughs> it's actually it's really good. And um, you know, I don't know anything about the military. I did dress as I told you before. I dressed thematically <laughs> today. I don't know anything about the military, but I really enjoyed the book. And um, you covered three principles that I wholeheartedly agree with. And um, that I would say are behind every successful thing I've ever done in my whole life. So um, it was cool to see them applied in a very organizational way. So could you kind of go through these three principles and give us a basic overview so that our viewers who may not have yet read the book, although you should viewers, could kind of get an idea of what it's all about. Yeah, well, the, the book is about two leaders and two organizations that were in the top 1% of the top 1% of the top 1% in their field. So, <laughs> I mean, truly, truly ultra high performing organizations. And, you know, one, as Susan has mentioned, was a military unit and the other was a business enterprise, but they both achieved what was pretty much considered impossible in their fields. You know, the, the military unit was the only unit ever in the Cold War and since to win every simulated battle at the National Training Center. And that, you know, if, you, if you're not in the military or you're not in the Army for that matter and you don't know what the National Training Center is all about, it is a center designed to present scenarios that are so stacked against you that you will, win, you will learn through your failures. Because you can't win those scenarios. I mean, it, it is designed for you to lose. Wow. And we had a unit that won every single battle out there. And it was just a phenomenal experience. And then, you know, I joined a company after the military because the wall comes down. Wars are over. <laughs> yes. well, well, so I thought. And, you know, unfortunately um, for humanity, they're not. But um, I joined a company, a medical device company that had been growing for about 10 years at the time and then continued to grow at 20% a year, every year and every quarter of every year for 28 years. And wow. what was striking about that experience for me and coming off the, the 468 armor, the armor battalion experience was how similar the ethos inside both those organizations was. How similar the commitment to this achievement of these impossible goals was and how it felt to be inside for myself and, you know, my coworkers and co-leaders inside the organization. So, you know, the, that's what the book is about, is trying to collect the secret sauce to this ultra high performing organizations and deliver it in a fashion that's useful for people to understand. So in working with those two leaders, um, I, you know, we, we, we were able to boil down the essence of what was different about those two organizations into three fundamental themes. And the first was, there was an absolute crystal clear clarity of purpose. Absolutely crystal clear. There was no doubt in 468 Armor or at Stryker Corporation, what the top leader and what the organization was trying to achieve. And it was simple. Simple, you could say it in three words, you know, at 468 Armor, we're gonna go nine and oh, at the National Training Center. And in Stryker, it was 20% growth. And you just, everything in the organization 
rallied and was focused around achieving that clarity of purpose. And then secondly, um, you know, these two leaders were both, you know, they were both individually monomaniacally obsessed with achieving their purpose. But what made it powerful is that they were able to get the rest of the organization to share that obsession and empower that kind of obsession throughout the organization to make things happen that would allow achievement of the purpose. And then those two things all kind of led into what was maybe the most powerful theme uh, was unleashing creativity. What those organizations did, that tank battalion in one year, you know, developed systems and processes that are still used in the army. I mean, they changed the doctrine. And what Stryker's done over its history as a corporation really has changed markets and technology and business structure and organization in, inside its own organization in ways that were profound. And everybody got involved in that process of unleashing their own innate in creativity or creativity maybe they didn't even know they had and it came out and all inspired because uh, you know there was a popular saying by a number of folks at Stryker that uh, and, and you hear it a lot today is you know talent it's all about talent talent's all that matters <laughs> talent matters a lot but you know what leadership matters too it really does and um, you know it's interesting I hear from a lot of the, and, and a lot of my guests don't know that during my day job, I'm an executive coach to nonprofit leaders and other CEOs. And so one thing I hear quite frequently is that they're not always quite sure what to do with those folks who either aren't capable of performing better or who just are the kind of folks who want to clock in, clock out, get their paycheck and be done. But, but that doesn't seem to happen under the model that you talk about in your book. How do you lead those underperformers in this model? Yeah, in that model, well, a, a couple of things. And, I, and I'll contrast it because I think it's a little bit different for the Army unit than it was for the <laughs> business enterprise. I would imagine. Um, and, you know, I'll start with the business enterprise. Because in the business enterprise, you know, Stryker built this reputation over time. And, you know, it was a small company that grew to be a huge corporation in the local community and has done profound things for that local community as well. But it built a reputation as, you know, that's a pretty, that's a, they're a great company. They grow and they perform and they deliver results for their shareholders, but it's a hard place to work. You know, it's, <laughs> it's tough there. I mean, you work hard when you're at Stryker and that, that was justly earned. Um, but as you build that reputation, and, and I'm, hard work doesn't have to be the reputation that you build, but you build a reputation that your organization does X. It has this clear purpose and this is what we do. Well, people will self-select themselves into or out of the organization. So you tend mm. to, as you, as you grow, you tend to attract those people that are inspired by that. You know, I, I, I interviewed a, with a lot of companies and I went through with a group of junior military officers that was also interviewing. A lot of folks, they were kind of scared to interview at Stryker. Because <laughs> it was, oh my gosh, they're going to, you know, they're not going to have this formal, at the time, they didn't have a formal training program and a bunch of other things. So I thought, oh, that's, that's for me. I want to go do something right away. Yeah. <laughs> so that, you know, that's one one piece of it is, is the selection process. And in many cases, uh, you know, if you have that... Um, definition out there of who you are and what kind of company you are, people will self-select. You don't even have to select them yourselves. They'll self-select into that. Yeah. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, at the business enterprise, you know, you want engaged employees. And having engaged employees is all about, I mean, clarity of purpose, all those things are powerful multipliers on it. But if you don't have the right managers in place, because it's that first level supervisor that matters most to the engaged employees. So if you've got a bunch of employees in your organization that aren't engaged, don't you don't necessarily need to look at them. You might want to look at their first level manager and what are, what are they doing to engage the employee base? What are they doing to engage the people that are reporting directly to them? Because that is, that people don't leave companies. They leave managers. Um, uh -huh. and, if, and if you can, um, have a great selection of managers in place, people that want to do that. They don't do it because they, oh, I want to get promotion and make more money. No, they do it because 
They want to lead people and make a difference in, in people's lives and, and watch other people advance in their careers and whatnot. Then you'll get engaged employees. So, you know, the second part of the question, how do you do that in an armor unit where, you know, Fred DeBella came on, uh, this is the, the Lieutenant Colonel that commanded mm -hmm. the extraordinary unit. And he had a year to go and get ready for the National Training Center. And he came into an environment where the previous commander had essentially been relieved. Mm. Um, so it was the worst performing unit, arguably in the United States Army. Wow. The worst. Wow. Uh, and doesn't get a chance to change out many people. And yet a year later, it, and it's like a NCAA last place college football team getting a new coach and the next year winning the national championship. And it just doesn't happen, but it, yeah. but it did. So what did, what did Fred do? Well, there was a few things, you know, a few personnel changes that he made, but then, he, you know, he took the organization that he had, figured out the strengths and weaknesses of each commander, of each, you know, of each leading sergeant within uh, NCO, within each part of the organization. So, okay, we're going to organize around our strengths. And we developed a thing called a playbook. And this playbook was how we conduct combat operations. It simplified things. It was a, if you're familiar with football, the wishbone offense is a very simple run heavy offense. You got six plays that you got to master and that's it. Um, and we kind of applied that philosophy to, to fighting a maneuver war. But uh, each part of it to engage people, to get them to understand it. Well, first of all, Having that simple philosophy helped engage people. I, I know what, what I'm doing in this battle. I know who's on my left and who's on my right. And, and I know those people because I've been with them for this last three, six, nine months of training. I know who they are. And they're always on my left or my right. We don't customize the, um, the, the arrangement of the units for each play. We, we have a, a standardized arrangement. So they build relationships. So they know each other. They care about each other. And in, you know, in combat, in soldiers going into combat, they love each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and you develop that ethos in, uh, within the organization. So it's clear what the purpose is. It's clear how you can impact it. You're, it's organized around the strengths of your unit and your commander. You know, my commander was, he, he, he was, um, he was a simple guy, um, but he had a feel for terrain. He had a feel for, for tank gunnery and all, and we had a, a, a complement of sergeants within our tanks that we did all, uh, every platoon had somebody that had been to this elite master gunner school, which not, you know, not a lot of units have, but we had three guys. <laughs> Fabulous. And so we were great at long range tank gunnery. So we designed the, the battalion, the higher level headquarters designed our plays that, okay, we're going to put Alpha Company, that was my company, in position to do the shooting because that's what they're great at. And the other companies, were, you know, we designed the plays around doing the things that they were great at. And if they were, uh, you know, and then because you had that definition, you became so engaged of, we don't need to be just good at tank gunnery. We got to be the best ever. Because that's the only way we can beat the OP4. This unit at the NTC is the only way we're going to beat them. We have to be the best in the United States Army at tank gunnery. So we focused our efforts and training and our time around doing that. And it was that kind of environment that there wasn't anybody disengaged. Because everybody had a, they had a role to play. They had something where they felt if you talk to pretty much any soldier in that unit, there is a point where they could say, you know what, this is when I influenced the results of a battle. Mm. I made that happen. Whether it was a tank driver, whether it was somebody that got supplies to, some, to a place on time, whether it was a medic, it, everybody felt like they had an impact on the results that we were delivering. And it was mm -hmm. the same way at Stringer. Wow important leadership lessons, I think, and, and things that, you know, when I, when I got your book, I was so anxious to talk to you because I was like, ah, where we need the best leaders in the military, we can learn so much. And so I was, I was very excited to read this. And, and I do think, um, not, not exactly related to the book, but I do think that there is something really unique about veterans who have this 
kind of knowledge and this level of commitment and structure. And I think it makes them exceptional additions to any company. I mean, you know, I, I, I never understand why, you know, we don't have more companies that are super excited to employ veterans. I mean, I, you know, you know, that oh, whole, yeah. it's just, so it's I, that we found it to be almost universally true that the veterans we hired that fit, you know, they fit our profile, but the right. veterans ended up being many of the top performers. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible to me. Well, this is a great book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and I certainly enjoyed talking with you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you, Susan. All right, viewers, this is the book, Commanding Excellence, and it's available now. We're going to put links in the show notes for today. So make sure you get this book. All right, viewers, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.